Uh, NBC's chief political analyst, Chuck Todd, arguing that both Biden and Trump have more to lose than gain from this first debate. And Chuck joins me now, along with USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page. Great to have the two of you. Mm -hmm. You've seen so many debates, right. um, hits and misses. Chuck, right. what's, what have they got to lose? Well, I will say this. We've fallen into this trap before where we get so excited about a first confrontation. Sometimes it's a first primary debate or first general election debate. And then we always go, whoa, well, they, didn't, they didn't really lay a glove on each other. They really were sort of feeling each other out. And it's like, yeah, because for suddenly their operatives remind the candidates, hey, there's a lot of people tuning into you guys for the very first time. You're making a first impression. And, and while these guys have already made their first impressions, arguably, <laughs> there's still somewhat of that. And I do think, you know, six weeks ago, Biden really needed to do something to shake up the race. What's interesting is that in the last six weeks, I could argue both campaigns have gotten steadier. Both campaigns feel better about yeah. their current yeah. state. And operationally, both campaigns are in a better place than they were six weeks ago. And so when you're entering a debate where you're actually feeling like your path to victory is visible to you, you're going to be a little more risk averse. And I just look, these are they, I'm not saying Captain Chaos won't show up. But I think if you're coming from the perspective of the operatives I've talked to, I think this could be less fireworky than people think. Yeah. And it was high risk, high reward for Joe Biden because the exposure without a teleprompter on a stage for 90 minutes, you know, he could falter and any single moment could be could go viral, especially the way even innocent moments, not, you know, not damage, undamaging moments like in at the G7 are, you know, faked and edited out of context. You know, they've, they've not only had their first impression made, their second and third and fourth impressions, they're all made. <laughs> their images, their views, the views of voters to that each of these candidates is set in political concrete. So the risk now, I think, is less to like make an impression you've never made before, more that the other guy or you make some kind of error right. that then gets repeated over and over and over again on cable TV and on social media, and that that becomes the image that people remember. You don't want to be the stereotype that the other's painting, yes. right? And that's what I think they both, right? The stereotype that Biden wants to paint a Trump is the unhinged guy. Stereotype that, you know, Trump wants to paint a Biden is he's not all there. So if you fall into either one of those stereotypes, that's a problem. And if the expectation now is that Donald Trump will perform the way he did at the first debate last time around, when, you know, he was all over the place, and even though there's not an audience to feed upon, to, to, you know, give him that echo effect, as well as the microphones being muted, there's also less chance of that happening because he, he can see the strategy. And he knows that he needs to be presidential. Well, I'd also go back, you know, he's, you know, he's, when he's really feeling aggrieved, he'll let you know. Think about where he was four years ago at this point and then eight years ago at this point. This is actually the less aggrieved he's felt in a long time. The entire party's rallying around him. It's the first time that's happened. The entire party wouldn't rally around him in 20. The entire party wouldn't really rally around him in 16. Here he is there. So, I, you know, he's... he. You know, we sometimes treat him as that he's always a five-year-old. And the fact is, he learns... You know, maybe he t he doesn't learn conventionally, but he learns. And I think he's self-aware of how damaging he personally was to himself in that first debate. You know, night. we do see him running this better campaign or more traditional campaign, better organized, more focused on, on strategy. And that leads you to believe that he'll do the same when he goes into this debate. On the other hand, when you see him in these big rallies... It's pretty much the traditional Donald Trump. The shark effect and yeah. Hannibal Lecter. Exactly. We just don't air him. Exactly. We just don't take, you know, this, and we can get into that debate, but, you know, Susan's right. It's the same Trump at the rallies. We just don't cover him with the same intensity or urgency as we did before. And, Susan, does Donald Trump almost win by acting normal? <laughs> Well, maybe they both win. Maybe the expectations for both have been set sufficiently low that each of them can win by just by Donald Trump just seeming pretty rational, not too crazy, and by Joe Biden looking awake and in charge and, and engaged. I mean, in some ways, the stakes are really high, but the way we're going to rate them may not be so high. And Chuck, how difficult might it be to get to rattle Donald Trump right now, what what could they use? Is it the, the cases? Is it January 6th? Well, and this is the thing, and this is what I think Biden has to be careful of. I think it takes a really nimble debater to figure out how to poke an opponent and at the same time not look like you're just trying to poke an opponent. 
And I think if Biden does it the wrong way, then it looks like he's more obsessed with Trump than he is the American voter. Right. So I think that's where the risk comes in of trying to bait the opponent. I think they're each want to bait each other. But if you know, that's where the punishment come from. You look and they do have an incentive to act normally because they're both campaigns are nervous of the Kennedy effect. And if they are if they turn into the two Muppet old guy Muppets yelling at each other, then a lot more voters are Kennedy curious. And that hurts both of their campaigns. So there is a real incentive for them to actually both want in order to keep Kennedy from becoming a relevant player in all this. And Kelly O'Donnell's been doing a lot of reporting on all of this, of course, from the White House. And she has, uh, that there have been various mock debates and a lot of different sessions at Camp David, but she's now reporting uh, that they're not ruling out the White House team some new proposals. And we've known that he's done that before. And he certainly is preparing for something to counteract a vice presidential dramatic proposal from the other side. And then there's the question of the handshake, Susan. And it wasn't because of COVID, you know, the last time around in 2020, uh, will they shake hands? Will they? I think it seems to me that yeah. they'll shake hands. I think they'll shake hands. I mean, what are you going to refuse to shake hands with the guy? I mean, maybe, but I, I don't I don't see that. I do think that debates usually turn not on some new policy proposal. They turn on, is this a person I trust? Maybe somebody I'd like, somebody, at least someone I trust to handle whatever the challenges of the next four years are. So it would be hard to see what kind of proposal, policy proposal, either guy could make that would really score and make a difference. I agree with that. Just uh, quickly, to each of you, a second left, do you have a favorite in terms of which of those three possible Veeps do you think would do the most good for Donald Trump? Chuck? Oh, I, look, I, I think if he's thinking about who he wants as a partner while governing, it's Bergam. I think if he's thinking at all about November, then it's not Bergam. That's the way I look at it. It's either Bergam because he is the most Pence-like. And I think people forget Trump really liked the job Pence did. Right. And up until up then. until one um, up until one day in January. I'm betting on Burgum, too. Yeah. Uh, and because it's his choice. It's it's Trump's choice. It's not his campaign's choice. It's not Don Jr.'s choice. Uh, and I think Burgum is the guy who brings some qualities he likes and doesn't threaten to steal the spotlight from and him. And he's got some cash at hand. Lots like of cash. And he could spend dollars. more of it yeah. as a candidate directly right. for office. Chuck Todd, it's always great to see you. Thank Especially you. on a Wednesday when we get your call yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Susan Page, my friend. Thank you. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.